Before I ask our keynote speaker to come uh, before us, this is folks trying to get settled in, I, I want to share something that uh, she and I have in common that you may not know. She knows. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Secretary of the California Department of Food and Ag and, the, and all Ag Commissioners share uh, similar authorities. The secretary has authority over the entire state, and the ag commissioners, each one of us within the jurisdictional boundaries of our respective counties. Since about a year ago in January, when Karen was appointed secretary, she started a blog for CBFA. And so many of us have been following this blog and because I believe you are what you blog, I wanted, I wanted to offer uh, a couple of uh, quotes from a couple of Secretary Ross's more recent uh, blogs. This one is from January 26th, and I'll just read it to you. My, e my email inbox lit up last week after Yahoo published a story claiming that College degrees in agriculture are useless. It certainly is a counterintuitive statement. Across the country, farming is hotter than ever. Agricultural exports broke records in 2011. And the demand for local production of food made available through farmers markets and other venues is an exciting trend that I firmly believe is here to stay. I'll repeat that. Local production of food made available through farmers markets and other venues is an exciting trend that I firmly believe is here to stay. A more recent quote from a, a piece titled How California Can Nurture the Next Generation of Farmers. And I'll, again, I'll read this. California has long been known for its flourishing agricultural sector from small niche farms to larger operations, large scale operations. Our state's farms have been critical in creating jobs and safe, locally grown food for our tables. So, two very recent articles where Secretary Ross is talking about locally grown produce. That really says, I believe, who she is and where she stands. And so, I believe California is very fortunate to have Secretary Ross back from D.C. to be the greatest ag producing state in the union only sounds right to me. And so with that, uh, I want you to please help me welcome Secretary Ross. Thank you, Henry. Um, I have to tell you that uh, well, first of all, the lunch is great, and I'm dying for the recipe for the salad. Okay, got that out of my chest. Um, I also have to tell you, I'm more than a little bit nervous to speak to you because I feel so humble to be in the position that I'm in and to stand before you because of so much of what you have done here over the last 10 or 11 years through this venture has been so inspiring for so many other activities around the state. And I've been sitting here this morning um, thinking, so how can I add value to this conversation? So if it sounds a bit disjointed, it's because I want to take some of the thoughts that occurred to me this morning and the fact that many of you who are very eloquent spoke before me and covered some of my thoughts. But I thought it would be helpful to remember one of my favorite sayings from my younger days, which is to think globally and act locally to really remind us that here in Ventura County and here in the state of California, we are part of a much larger global economy and a global community. And we know how very, very fortunate we are to be a part of California as farmers and as leaders because we are so productive. And I can talk about the numbers, $37.5 billion at the farm gate last year. 
24% of our product goes into export markets. We have the most organic acres in the country. We have the most farmers markets in the country. We have the most community supported agriculture subscription rates in the country. We have a diversity of agriculture to meet the demand and the choices that our consumers want regardless of what their means are and what their desire is. We have farmers who farm an acre in a city. We have small scale new farmers farming on the urban edge where they thought very carefully about their business model. And it is about, I am only going to sell, and we heard it this morning, 40 to 50 miles from home. I'm going to focus on chefs and a couple of specialty stores. I am only going to do organic production. And I have many good friends who are large scale, conventional, whatever the heck that word is, farmers who are multi-generation families who literally farm thousands of acres and are passionate about taking that high quality California product to over a hundred countries around the world. In California, because of our Mediterranean climate, because of the university systems and extension that have given us the resources, because we've had the land, the water, and might I add, the most innovative people in farming in the state, we can and we do do it all. And that diversity is our strength. And I embrace it and I hold it up and I never once feel like I'm talking out of all sides of my mouth. Because there are some very important things for us to remember. And that is um, one in six Americans or citizens of California do not know where their next source of food is going to come from. That is a very powerful number that we must never lose sight of. That many people in this country are low wage earners and they depend on affordable, accessible, convenient, whatever it might be. We have a rich diversity of consumers and we want to be able to offer them a rich diversity of farming systems to meet their needs. And that's a very important thing for us to remember. We also have to bear in mind what is being talked about over and over in this past year. And that is we are part of a fast growing global population. We have 7 billion people here today. Every day we add 220,000 additional mouths to the global population. And by 2050, which is not that far away, we will have 9 billion people to feed. It is important that we, from a moral position, are able to grow food and deliver food to those people. But it's also important that we reach out and help them learn how to farm sustainably for themselves. And those are tremendous opportunities that I hope we don't lose sight of. I think that what you are doing here and what you have done since 1999 is one of the most important things ever. You know, I am very lucky to work for a man who believes in California, and I do. I'm very lucky to work for a man who doesn't want to be a naysayer. Do we have our challenges? Yes, we do. But like me, he is an optimist. And he continually reminds us in California that this place is a special place and this place is a home of dreamers and innovators. And he's encouraging us now, today, to think big, bold ideas as we get our fiscal house in order, as we right-size government, as we align to the local level where the best solutions come to our challenges. He's reminding us not to be shy about being big and bold. And I, Karen Ross, am adding another challenge to the big and bold. To not be afraid of having brave ideas. And I think that in the current cultural, political, um, baloney stuff that's going on in this day and age, what is really brave is focusing on all that we have in common. 
it's easy to be on the polarized sides. It's easier to raise money for whatever our cause is. It's easier to say, I don't need to apply critical thinking to that. I saw it once in print, or I saw it once on the website. That must be the truth. What is brave is taking the time, investing the intellect, to come together, to listen to one another, and to share all the things that we have in common. And what is the biggest commonality of all humankind on the globe? We eat. I especially love to eat, and I especially love to eat California food. So what you are doing is helping to shorten the distance between a farmer and an eater. And that's a powerful thing to do. And you need to keep doing that because we can only get to better results if we can come closer together. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can do that, and it's happened a lot. And one of my favorite words, and it's been mentioned a couple of times today, well, there's two. One is engagement. I know we talk a lot about, well, I just need to educate you and then you'll love me. But really what we need to do is engage each other, which is the act of listening and having a conversation and both of us feeling like, I've got some skin in this game. So engagement is one of the things that you're accomplishing here, and that's a great thing to do. And the other word that I just love is connectivity. Because for me, life is all about understanding how close each one of us is to the other. Yes, I know there's the Kevin Bacon thing about six degrees of separation. But really and truly, Think about connectivity. And if we want to change the system, regardless of what it is we're talking about, it's remembering that we're all in this together, that we're all part of the community, and that we are connected. We're connected through the problems and the challenges, and we're connected by coming up with the solutions. So you have a tremendous opportunity to make a huge difference in taking steps in that direction. Um, I had the pleasure yesterday of going through Food Share and love the fact that in this community, Bonnie said, well, you know, we're really kind of cash poor and food rich. What a fabulous trademark for Ventura County that your farmers and their employees have produced food and have always found a way in times of excess to turn that into access for people, your neighbors, who don't have as much. That is a powerful statement. We're cash poor compared to other larger food banks, but we're food rich. The diversity of what you're putting into those food baskets is a marvelous thing for you to do. Um, what you have done here has been very inspiring, and I'm just going to run through a few things that you have helped spawn around the state of California. Who knew that Ventura County was the incubator of starting massive movements of all kinds of good things? And yes, one of the roads that we all have in common is Joseph McIntyre and Ag Innovation Center. But um, last year, one of the first things I did with my colleague, Diana Dooley, who is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, is we convened a meeting of representatives from all the food policy councils and ag alliances in the state. Because we knew that there were several in the state, and at that time, there were 22 in the state. So think about what you're doing in local communities to have this kind of a dialogue, to understand each other, to share ideas about how to solve the problems that we want to attack together. What you're doing is you're giving me the quilt pieces that I get to help stitch together with my colleague, Diana Dooley. We had our first meeting last June. We definitely want to convene that group on an annual basis at a minimum. But that happened because this county, not only did you do it, you did it 11 years ago, and you're still coming together to do it. That has been a very powerful example of what we can do around the state. As a result of hearing about efforts like this, three and a half years ago when I was on the State Board of Food and Agriculture, we decided we wanted to try to bring together diverse stakeholders to create a vision for agriculture in California in 2030. Because we felt that if some of the public policy decisions that were being made kept being made the way they were, 
It would be hard to imagine us being the productive party that we are to feeding people here and around the world. So we created California Agricultural Vision Strategies for Sustainability. Twelve strategies, I'm looking at Eric, he was part of that, Joseph was part of that, Cesar was part of that, Glenda was part of that, there are many people in this room who were part of that. We went around the state, we did five listening sessions around the state, we collected testimony from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who had a vision of California agriculture and what it meant to their lives and what they wanted it to mean for the future of California. We then convened a series of meetings, um, invited participants to make sure we had broad representation of all the voices in the food system that were willing to roll up their sleeves and come together to narrow down all of those things we wanted to do together to get to 12 strategies. Now, I was the Fink who moved to Washington, and so I didn't get to help finish it. But I am so pleased with the outcome. This is not just words and paper. These are strategies that are inspiring action throughout the state of California. Strategy number one, as an example, is to ensure access for every Californian to healthy, safe, California-grown food. That we want to make sure that we are inspiring and nurturing the next generation of farmers and ranchers that we have research in the 21st century that will help us meet all the challenges, whether it be food safety or how to farm with less land and less water, because that's happening globally, that we have research that works, that we have a workforce that is valued, has access to the tools that they need to continually improve their opportunities in life. These are the kinds of strategies these broad stakeholders put together, and it's pretty interesting stuff. When it was presented to the governor before he was sworn in, it was a big day in Sacramento because that's exactly what we wanted and he has empowered us to work together across cabinet to achieve this. Interestingly enough, over the last few years we've also had another statewide initiative called Health in All Policies. It's about how we grow in a very sustainable way and one of the top strategic objectives of that, which is done completely separately from this, is that all Californians, where they work, where they go to school, and where they live, have access to healthy California-grown food. See the common denominator here? Eaters. We all have something in common. Um, we also have, going on at the state level, legislation that was passed last year by the speaker that created the Healthy Food Finance Initiative. And that created a task force and mandated that my department create a report by June that will talk about all the ways we can improve access in neighborhoods, in schools, in, in business places. Um, Paula, I think you're going to be on that. I hope you're going to be at the committee meeting next week. Good, 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 good. So we, we have some things that we can do, but it's building on what's happening at local levels. We have a farm bill that will be maybe rewritten this year. We went through this kind of unusual exercise in the last half of 2011, where we scrambled to hold five listening sessions around the state. We met with 70 stakeholder groups to put together California priorities for the farm bill. Those priorities were signed off and sent back to Congress. They were signed by my agency, <coughs> Resources Agency, EPA, Health and Human Services. That sent a really strong signal because think about it. If we could get just our California delegation to line up on the priorities, <coughs> we can make a big difference on the Farm Bill. And that's an invitation for all of us to participate in. I'm trying to think all the different ways we have here. Um, we have a governor who really wants your engagement in what makes government work. There are, we were just talking about this, there are many boards and commissions in the state. I have a bunch of them in my department and we have them all across government. He has worked overtime to make sure that all the voices are at the table and anyone who's ever had an interest in a topic should go to the governor's website and look for ways to be engaged in making this state work better. I think people like you who have come together at the local level to really stress what you have in common know how to make a difference. 
know how to be the grown-ups in the room, know how to make things work better. So that's another invitation I have for you. Finally, I wanted to touch on how we are trying to make sure that we're removing barriers for access to food and successful productivity by our farmers. And one of those is looking at the regulatory system that we have and getting out of this tendency to have a regulatory system that's one size fits all because that really is not very productive and it's not very efficient. So for the past six months, we've had a work group looking at direct-to-consumer market opportunities where we've broken into small groups around farmers markets, improvements that can be made there, um, community-supported agricultural and what we can do there, farm stands, agritourism, farm to school, food access for our food banks. Um, that group has committed to me that they will have recommendations to me by July. And I think that can be very helpful for all of us. Maybe we can't do all of it at the state level, but we could do a lot of it at the local level. Concurrently, my state veterinarian has convened a series of meetings around small herd and cow share programs. That's another area of great interest. And in a state that literally produces one-fifth of the milk that is consumed on a daily basis by Americans, getting this dairy thing right, whether it's goats, sheep, Camels, yes, we've had inquiries about raw camel milk out of Israel. So camels, you know, whatever it is. We want to make sure that we're facilitating the dialogue and that we're not afraid to take a look at our system and the way it's been built over decades, but that we are willing to look at it with fresh eyes and say, does this still make the best sense for what's going forward? Including, how do we provide the educational tools to our very small and new farmers, many who come from different cultural backgrounds, to understand the importance of good agricultural practices so that we have safe food as well. I am tremendously optimistic about the opportunities that are before us. And one of the things I want to close with is my plea to you to not allow us to get caught up into only this way is the right way, small is the best way, big is bad. I would point out to you that most of the farmers that I know in this state have started as very, very small-scale farmers. And in the wine business that I came out of, every time they had a child who actually wanted to come back to the farm, which has not necessarily been the trend, but I think it's coming back, they had to take a look at growing their business to be able to provide a living for mom and dad, and son or daughter and their spouse, and then another one and another one. How do we get to multi-generational families? Most times we do have to grow. We have to figure out a way to vertically integrate. We have to figure out a way to add value. So I hope that you all will heed my plea that small is great, mid-size is fabulous, multi-generation families who are committed to continuous improvement, which they are, also have a very important place in our local, regional, and global food systems. And California is absolutely the place that can do it all. We can meet the expectations of our consumers for the choice that they're looking for in the marketplace. And we can also let the farmer choose the business model that works best for them. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for being here. And I want you to know how deeply I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you very much. that are impacting farmers hardest 
in this day and age are things that I don't have statutory authority for. So it is an EPA, it is a resources agency, it is at the labor agency. The governor has really empowered us to work across cabinet to solve problems. And so we have a number of um, very positive task force issues going on around how do we become more efficient in our regulatory process so that we're not sacrificing public health goals or environmental goals, but we're smarter about how we get those achieved. Um, Secretary Rodriguez spent a day with me in Watsonville three weeks ago to better understand stronger production systems and coastal agriculture. So we have a lot of efforts going on like that. And one thing I did forget to mention is the Farm to School, that's another linkage that we have coming from the local communities, is that um, many of the other agencies, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, and others were working on strategic growth and Farm to School initiatives and realized they needed to have linkage with the farmers. And so there's an effort to fund an office at CDFA so that we can help link farmers and schools and try to bring some organization around it. So um, we spend a lot of time on environmental issues and environmental health for our state and helping it to be easier for farmers to comply and to recognize the environmental benefits that come from working landscape with good stewards. Great, let's have another question. I know I've got one queue up here and we'll come over. And I also wanted to remind you of these great opportunities for solution spaces, and things that we want to capture on the end of this thing, because that's a tremendous opportunity. Who's next? Thank you. Please. Thank you very much for coming and addressing us. I, I can't promise that this is an easy question, but it's something that I know many, many folks in the farming and ranching community are very concerned about. Uh, Williams Act, the future of Williams Act, and, and uh, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that there are uh, a lot of thousand dollars to Williams now this year and um, you know this bunch of funds are now being dealt with by local jurisdictions. So I just wonder if there might be a future for the Williams Act and what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Secretary Laird and I talked about this in December because he is as passionately committed to farmland preservation as I am. Um, and it just happens to be that the Williamson Act is housed in his agency, so once again, I have to use charm and good talking to have him want to work my way. But the fact that we both understand the importance of that, and especially just a slight tick in the economy, and we'll see the pressure on developing more farmland just really take off. Um, there's a couple of things, and I think what's happening at the local level here, as well as in some of the other food policy councils, is helping to connect the dots of if we want local food, we need local farmers, we need some land, we need some water to make that all happen. And we don't really have a strong land ethic in the state where it takes huge political will to say this is a priority for funding. And so we've seen a lot of new land trusts up and down the valley and some of the coastal areas that are very focused on um, raising the funds through mitigation fees to buy conservation easements so that farmers can continue to farm the land and be productive, but it's taken some of that development pressure off without them sacrificing what may be in the best long-term interest for their family. But Secretary Barry and I, now that he finally got a director for Department of Conservation, are going to start this year to take a look at, is the Williamson Act the way it was designed 30 plus years ago? the right way of doing this, and how do we make sure that farm, working farm and ranch land is preserved as a legacy and a part of a vibrant economy for California going forward. So I can't give you any answers what that's going to look like, but it's very high on the radar screen. Thanks for the question. Oh, Henry, you can ask me a question anytime. <laughs> yeah, but I want everybody else to get the here too. in addition to all of the funding for our, our, our system affairs in the state. So 
it is really um, where we are at this point in time requires that we focus exclusively on core mission, and there's a lot of programs we've given up. So our invasive species program, being able to exclude those pests, having really good surveillance and rapid response systems, is, is very vulnerable right now, and I'm not going to exaggerate that. But I'm also convinced that with the partnership we have with the federal government and our county ad commissioner partners and the industry, that we can keep an effective safety net in place. But we have to be willing to not be afraid of change and to look at the system and go, with today's technologies, are there some different ways we could do this more efficiently and effectively to accomplish the mission? And we have to be willing to do that. But it's it's not going to be easy. But it's a big hit. Thank one you. We've got time for just another one, please. I bet this is a team one. Yeah, if you want. Uh, Ron Heiber has been kind of a COVID secretary, so I'm really disappointed to see my tax dollars go to uh, come down really hard on the raw milk uh, producers, such as Ross and Dairy. It's great to hear that you're talking about uh, reviewing the uh, animal share program, but it would be nice to see just an open uh, 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 arrangement for small dairies, which the data uh, suggests aren't a major contributor to food poisoning have uh, an open, some kind of open regulation that would support those. And then uh, kind of along that line, local, small local um, uh, slaughterhouses or mobile uh, outdoors that uh, would make small herd um, rearing uh, commercially viable. And then also, it would be great to see labeling of genetically engineered foods. Okay, did you want um, responses or um, <laughs> just um, I have to, I have to say for the record that California is one of a small number of states that allows for the legal sale of raw milk as long as it's done under the required sanitary requirements, um, and that the recent incident that you're referring to, five children became critically ill, and there's a direct connection to the dairy that has since um, done some sanitation improvements to get to that. But it just shows the importance that we all have really good agricultural practices because we don't want our good food to in any way jeopardize the life of, of um, our students. And with regard to um, genetically modified organisms, I know there's a lot of interest in that and that people are betting for transparency in the food system. There's, it's not something that's regulated at the state. It is under federal regulation and there is a very complex um, arrangement across multiple agencies at the federal level, but Secretary Vilsack has convened um, a committee that he's asked to finish their work this year to really look at coexistence mechanisms to make sure that we have adequate buffers and other types of things as a first step of what he can do given the limited statutory authority he has for that piece of that. I want to thank you all very much again for allowing me to be here today.